Andy uh, has specialised in tax dispute work since uh, 2000 and has wide experience in civil tax fraud investigations, tax amnesties, tax disclosures and expert witness work, uh, including professional indemnity assignments. Andy has carved a niche in criminal defence case work and is regularly sought by defence lawyers and counsel to provide insightful and critical expert witness support. Andy has conducted presentations for the IFA Leeds branch on many occasions. So some of you have already met Andy and you would have met him in July. <coughs> um, now, I remember uh, last time uh, there was a good interest in pubs, Andy. So uh, I don't know if this is going to feature again uh, this time round, but um, welcome again. It's good to have you back. Uh, I'm glad that uh, the, the, the roadworks were uh, on your side and the technology was on your side this morning. So uh, welcome again and over to you. Thank you, John. That's uh, very kind of you. Um, I, I hope we can manage to squeeze uh, a question or a, an example in relation to pubs in, into the material, but let, let's see uh, Let's see how we go. So uh, good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for your time. Um, the topic we're gonna cover this morning is something that periodically uh, we encounter as advisors, um, the, the unfortunate death, the passing away of a client. Um, what we're not going to touch on in detail this morning is inheritance tax per se arising from the death, largely because that tends to be mostly dealt with by lawyers, not universally, but mostly. But there are taxes and there are issues that we do need to consider um, that will affect us as advisors arising from the death of a client. One of the things that we will look at in a, quite a bit of detail, because this does tend to crop up from, uh, from the clients per se, is around property, uh, the household, the, the home, the residential home. Um, the, there's a new relief or a relatively new relief in relation to that. And that does tend to crop up quite regularly in dialogue with the client. So let's rattle on and, and crack on into the material. So I think what we need to look at first uh, is section 20 of the Taxes Management Act. Um, and this is around income taxes and capital gains tax uh, arising as a result of or in consequence of um, the client's death. Um, what statute limits the tax office, limits HMRC's ability to do is assess that individual. Um, whereas we know for a normal tax client, the, the revenue can assess up to six years if, um, if, if it's careless behavior and potentially up to 20 years if it's deliberate behavior. There are much tighter limitations placed on them um, where a taxpayer has passed away. Broadly, as the legislation says on the screen, um, they can assess no further than four years in advance of the end of the tax year in which the taxpayer died. Now, arguably, that could be almost five years, because if the taxpayer died right at the beginning of the tax year, there's that tax year and then four years from the end of it. If they die towards the end of the tax year, you're almost into four year territory. So whilst the, the legislation defines the end point, it is a bit of a moving um, fees depending on when the client unfortunately passes away. There's then a further limitation that the revenue within that four year period of time can only assess the six years prior to death. We're going to look at a quick example in this in, in due course. But as I say, those limitations are very, very uh, robustly uh, stated in statute and hopefully you will never encounter an inspector that tries to go beyond those. You never know, somebody might try it on, but um, I personally have never found an inspector to go beyond those boundaries, but please be aware of them because they are quite key. So, in terms of um, a couple of quick examples now to, to illustrate those two points, um, uh, Andrew, um, who unfortunately died on the night at, 19th of November 2015, um, didn't disclose something to HMRC um, in the period prior to his death. So within the 1819 tax year, um, the revenue have 
four years from the end of that tax year in which to raise an assessment to make good the loss that has arisen from what Andrew failed to disclose. So that sets your end point. Um, looking at a, perhaps a little bit more uh, involved example, if we take the, the situation of Mary, who dies in June 2017, so that's in 1718 tax year, they must raise that assessment before uh, by, sorry, they must do it by the 5th of April 2022. So that's four years after the end of the tax year in which she died, and they can only then go back to 2011-12. So of that 10 year period where she has deliberately omitted to disclose a source of income, some of that source will fall outside the scope of tax and there's nothing that the revenue can do for that. That is defined by statute. So be aware of these examples. They don't crop up very often, but it is well worth knowing. I've actually got a client myself at the moment uh, where the revenue we're intimating, actually going after them for 20 years. Uh, she unfortunately died um, and they've, in the last two weeks, sent me an email to confirm those specific time limits that we're, we're now looking at on the screen, four years after, six years before. So rem remember those where you're actually dealing with a client that may have some corrections to make in relation to their affairs. Okay. So there are, that is not my area of expertise, but I've, I've, I've just included this because it is slightly different for that. Um, for, for VAT, if there's uh, an assessment for a prescribed accounting period, it must be made within four years after the person's death. So we're not looking at tax years now, we're looking at specific um, period of death. So use the example of Chris, and he dies on the 15th of April 2019, any assessment to that must be made by the 14th of April 2023. So we're not looking at tax years, we're looking at actual date of death. So please remember there are different time periods applying for different taxes. Where that assessment is on um, the personal representatives to recover that lost as a result of deliberate behaviour of the deceased or any other person acting on their behalf, um, it may be made in respect of a prescribed accounting period. Again, this is HMRC language. Um, falling within the previous 20 years. So for VAT, you've got a much longer uh, period of consideration. So if we look at the example of Betty in this case, who dies on the 30th of November, 2018, and it's established that she's deliberately failed to make returns and account for VAT, uh, the correct amount of VAT for the past 12 years, all of those 12 years are open to be assessed provided the assessments are made by the 29th of November, 2022. So these are relatively straightforward examples. If you ever come across this in, in, in reality, it's likely the circumstances are gonna be more complicated, but the, the defining periods are set by statute. It's not a flexible uh, period that the revenue can just willy nilly choose what they can and what they can't assess, okay? If we now look at capital gains tax, um, it's very similar to income tax in this respect, um, in terms of assessing uh, abilities. There's a few more uh, things in relation to capital gains tax that uh, we do need to be aware of. But broadly, when a person dies, there's no CGT charge. The CGT charge does not arise as a result of the death. However, um, in terms of the assets that were owned by the deceased at the date of death, they're treated as though they're passed on to the personal representatives or any other person to whom they pass by law at the date of death at their market value. When they're passed on to the legatees, they're treated as though they've been passed to the legatees at the date of death at their market value on that date. It may be that they actually pass to the legatees many months afterwards. It may be even a couple of years afterwards. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, but they're treated as passing at that value at date of death. And importantly, you do not need to fill in capital gains tax summary pages um, as a result of death when you do the tax return for the period up to death. I believe we've now got a poll question. If 
Uh, we could fire that up, please. So let's uh, let's have a, just have a think about this. Is the annual CGT exemption prorated in the year of death? I'll just give you all a few moments to respond. Okay, do we do we have the results? Excellent, excellent. Um, yes, the majority of you guys have, have got that right. Can we flip to this slide, please? There is no restriction imposed on the annual exempt amount in the year that an individual dies where it's available. There may be some limited circumstances where it's not available, but that would uh, kick in first. The whole of the annual exempt amount is available to set against the deceased's chargeable gains arising in that year, irrespective of how short the period uh, from the 6th of April to the date of death is. So there's no limitation on the annual exempt amount. Um, losses, however, is an interesting one from a capital gains tax perspective. Uh, we all know that capital losses um, they're valuable to, to a client, um, but there's not really a great deal you can do with them other than set them against all the capital gains. And if you've got any excess, you carry it forward. Um, you can't be as creative with capital losses generally as you can um, with income losses, um, except in the period um, where a taxpayer has passed away, unfortunately passed away. Um, <coughs> losses in the period of death uh, must be set against any chargeable gains in that same period. That's pretty standard fare. If there's any allowable losses that remain after that has occurred, those losses can be carried back. This is unusual. You don't normally have the ability to carry capital losses back. You do in the final period uh, up to date of death. Um, the losses can be set against any gains arising in the three years prior to the date of death. Oh, sorry, prior to the tax year in which the death occurs. They're set against the most recent year first. And again, this is an important feature to, to take on board. When they're, when they're carried back, they're set against the net chargeable gains before the annual exemption. The annual exemption is preserved you limit the amount of loss set against the, the gain in the prior year, such that you preserve the annual exemption relief. So if for sake of argument, uh, a taxpayer has got gains of 50,000 against which 12,000 say of annual exemption has been set. So there's a net gain of 38,000. You set off losses of 38,000, not 50,000. So, you can then utilize that to a degree to carry back the surplus 12,000 can then be carried to the year before. I mean, clearly you need a client that's got the ability and the capacity to absorb these losses in that way. But there is this relief there in the date of death that can be taken advantage of. One thing to remember though, is any losses that can't be used are lost you can't carry the losses forward from the individual into the estate. Now we'll look at the estate briefly. Um, the personal representatives of the estate, these are uh, obviously the, the individual has passed away so they can no longer represent themselves. They can no longer represent the assets that um, they formerly owned. Um, that, stewardship becomes uh, the charge of the executor or personal representative um, who is looking after those assets on behalf of uh, the deceased estate. Though that individual um, executor, personal representative is chargeable to income tax on that arises on the assets of the estate. Important thing to note, 
the income tax is charged at basic rate only, except on dividends, which is, it will be seven and a half percent. Reason being, the estate is not chargeable at the higher rates of tax. They only apply to individuals. The estate isn't an individual, it's a trust. Okay, so important thing to, to, to remember that yes, income is chargeable on the estate, but it's the rate of tax that applies is limited. And to degree, it depends on what the character of the income is. Um, if the personal representatives sell any capital assets of the estate, they are themselves liable to capital gains tax uh, at the CGT rate, 28%. And you, they do need to fill in an SA 900 trust and estate return um, from the day after the date of death of the individual to the 5th of April. So the date of, unless somebody dies on the end of the tax year, there will be split returns for the year of death where returns are required. And the estate will have to file returns whilst it's generating income and potentially gains for every tax year thereafter until it has been fully administered. The C CGT, capital gains tax, does not apply to assets when they're passed to the legatees under the terms of the will. So when the executor, the personal representative, distributes those assets in accordance with the will or any other lawful provision, um, they, a, a CGT charge does not apply because they've had that uplift to market value at the date of death, as we've touched on in the early slide. So this is um, taxes that that whilst they're lifetime taxes of the individual, they are things that we do need to think about um, when the client unfortunately passes away. So the, de dealing with the death of a client is not just inheritance tax. It's thinking about these things that um, have occurred during the lifetime as well. But now let's, let's move forward and have a canter through a bit of inheritance tax. For, for most individuals, inheritance tax is not a an issue. Um, if the value of the estate is below 325,000, um, then there would be no IHT to be paid. Um, likewise, if it's more valuable than that, that everything is left to the spouse, civil partner or a charity, um, it would escape an inheritance tax charge. Um, however, and again, this is something to, to bear in mind, even if the, the value of the estate is below 325,000 pounds, so it's not gonna be a taxable um, estate, it is still reportable to HMRC. Simple reason, how do they know it's below the threshold unless they're told it's below the threshold? So there is a, a still a reporting requirement in that respect. And one of the things that um, HMRC can examine and probe is if the, the estate has been returned below uh, 325,000, but it's quite close to the limit, they could potentially challenge values, particularly if values have been used in the estate uh, returns, um, just to see if they can, they have an alternative view that it squeaks up above the threshold, in which case it brings it into chargeable. If the home is owned, uh, the tax free threshold can increase to 500,000. Um, if it is left to the children, um, whether that is adopted, fostered or step, uh, or grandchildren of the deceased. The slide says the estate is worth, provided the estate is worth less than X. We're now gonna have a look at what X is in another poll. So if we could fire up the poll, please. What is the value of, of the estate above which the enhanced relief for the home is withdrawn? So above a capital limit, the enhanced relief is no longer available or is it's, it's withdrawn on a tapering basis. What's that threshold? Is it 1 million, 2 million, 5 million? Give you a few moments to ponder that one. Okay, do we have 
some results. Interesting. Um, more than 50% of you uh, have gone for 1 million. The actual threshold is 2 million. So it is, it is actually more valuable um, than what is perceived. The 1 million is the maximum that a couple could potentially have in terms of allowance. 2 million is a threshold beyond which relief is can be withdrawn. We'll look at that in a moment. On the screen is a basic IHT uh, evaluation. You may or you may not get involved with this. Let's say lawyers tend to deal mostly with inheritance tax, inheritance tax returns, IHT 100s, IHT 400s, those, those sort of documents if you've ever come across them. They're not the simplest things to do. You may be uh, asked to get involved and help them with it, but you basically accumulate the assets of the individual, property shares, bank accounts, cash, jewellery, cars, micro lights, all that sort of stuff. Uh, take off the liabilities, mortgages, loans, overdrafts, credit cards, tax. So if there's any lifetime tax that's due, that needs to be included in there. Knock off the lifetime allowance, you come to a chargeable estate and that's taxable at 40%. There may be a further allowance in there for the home, depending on what the, the terms of the will are. What we're going to now look at is what that enhanced allowance is. So this is uh, the inheritance tax residential nil rate band, RNRB. Uh, and I did notice when I pulled the slides together, I've got NRNB in, in, on this slide. Um, uh, just simple typos, unfortunately. So apologies for that. Um, the RNRB was introduced with effect from the 2017-18 tax year onwards, and it was an escalating figure rising to um, 175,000 for the current tax year that we're in. Um, and that is on top of the 325,000 basic allowance that any individual gets in terms of their estate. Uh, and it is scheduled to rise in line with CPI from next tax year onwards. Um, any unused nil rate band, be that the basic or the RNRB, um, can be transferred to a surviving spouse or civil partner. Um, if an individual downsizes their property uh, or ceases to own a home on or after July 2015, um, any assets that they retain of an equivalent value um, of the additional RN, uh, RNRB and, and are passed on death to direct descendants will qualify. So it doesn't have to be the home itself um, that qualifies for the relief. It can be derived from. Let's have a look at some of the conditions for RNRB. Um, for RNRB purposes, the direct descendant, it has to be a direct descendant of the deceased, be a child or a grandchild or other lineal descendant. So it could be a great grandchild. Okay? Uh, it can be the husband, wife, civil partner of a lineal descendant. So it can be, um, and it can include a widow, widower or surviving civil partner. The person that inherits do, the home doesn't have to be under 18. Direct descendant does not include nephews, nieces, siblings, other relatives who are not included in the list above. Okay, So it has to be a direct lineal descendant. It doesn't work if the property is passed back up the family tree. So if it is the child that unfortunately passes away, passing back to mum and dad, or to grandparents, it doesn't work. It's descendant, not ascendant. Okay. For a home uh, that's left to a mixture of individuals, both direct descendants, other relatives, or potentially other people, the value of the home must be shared in proportion to their share of the property that each inherit as far as RNRB is concerned. So those that are direct descendants that inherit will get some RNRB against their inheritance. Those that aren't, won't. You can't mix the two. You can't blend the two for RNRB purposes. Okay. Let's have a quickie look at another example. Uh, Brenda unfortunately passes away in 2021. Her estate's valued at 500,000. In a will, she leaves half of the property um, to a stepson, qualifying descendant, 
and half to her nephew, non-qualifying. The RNRV is based on the value of the property left to the stepson, 250,000. The 250,000 that's attributable to the nephew would not qualify. It may attract some of the basic allowance, but not RNRV. But what's the value of the actual RNRV that's given? In this case, it will be restricted to £175,000, the amount of the relief for this tax year. The reason being, the, the, the relief is limited to the lower of the maximum RNRB allowance for the tax year and the value of the half share of the home that's been attributed to the descendant. So if the stepson's uh, value of home had been 150,000, 150, that would have been the extent of the RNRB allowance. You wouldn't attribute another 25,000 elsewhere because it wouldn't be qualifying. Okay. We're going through this material um, because these are the sort of questions that clients ask. So whilst the client maybe hasn't passed away, uh, these are the sort of things that they're, they're very much interested in, in terms of the home. Um, there's some further requirements, um, as we've touched on. Uh, it's got to be left to a lineal descendant. That has to be in the will under the rules of intestacy or by some other legal means. Um, it can't just be assumed. There has to be a, a particular uh, derivation in law as to who actually is inheriting the property for the relief to kick in. The, the property doesn't have to be specifically mentioned in the will. It can be inherited as part of what's called the residue of the estate. So if a client leaves specific legacies to um, aunts, uncles, nephews, nieces, and then residue to uh, children, that will be fine because the property is not falling within the defined specific legacies. It then must be falling within the residue. Okay. Um, where it does form part of the residue and the residue is passed on to different people, as we've touched on on the previous slide, uh, and some of those are qualified and some of those aren't, then they inherit in it, the, the availability of the or the availability of the relief is in proportion to how they inherit uh, the property in the first instance. Okay. There are complications with RNRB. Um, it only counts if it's a direct descendant and they be, be and they become entitled to the home when the person dies. If the will, have, for example, we go through another example now, if the will has a condition that the grandchildren um, have to reach a certain age before they inherit the property, the property is held in trust. So R and RB won't apply because they've not inherited, they've not directly inherited the property. Um, if the home is already held in trust by the person who passes away and it stays in trust when they die, the home will only qualify for RNRB if it becomes a direct part, if it becomes part, sorry, of the direct descendants estate after the person dies. So this could be the situation where the property is in a life interest trust and it's taxable on the individual who passes away as part of their estate. It then passes on to another life interest trust and becomes part of the estate of the descendant, who is a qualifying descendant, um, then that will be fine. If it's a discretionary trust, that will be much more of a problem. It wouldn't, it wouldn't work. Okay. We've got some other considerations that we need to take into account. Um, the, the actual home doesn't have to end up in the hands of the direct descendant. Um, an estate can still be eligible for the RNRB if the estate's personal representative sells the home as part of the administration of the estate and passes the proceeds on to the direct descendants. It's the, the qualifying condition is that the property was bequested, was bequeathed by the terms of the will to the descendant. They don't physically have to take ownership of it. They don't have to appear on the deeds. Um, equally, once the direct descendants have inherited a home, there's no restrictions on what they do with it. Um, they can sell it straight away if they want. 
um, it will still qualify for RNRB, even if they do sell it immediately upon inheriting. We've now got another poll. Fire that one up, please. Can a deed of variation bring about RNRB relief where otherwise it may not have been available? This is something that crops up occasionally with estates arising on the death of the individual. Let's see what you think. Okay, do we have some, some results, please? Well done, thank you. Um, the majority of you got that one right. Yes, it can. If we go over the page onto the next example, we'll, we'll see this in action. Um, the owner died in 1920 tax year, leaving a house worth uh, 500,000 to three grandchildren uh, as part of the residue of her estate. All that is fine. The maximum RNRB for that year was 150,000 pounds. The three grandchildren don't want to keep the property. Um, the personal representative sells it and distribute the sale proceeds uh, between the three grandchildren. As the property passes to the grandchildren under the terms of Fiona's will, the RNRB of 150,000 will be available in full, albeit they have not actually taken ownership of the property. What they've had is the funds that have been derived from it. If they want to, the direct descendants can also inherit the home if it's left to them as a result of amending the will by deed of variation. This was a poll question. So yes, you can vary the will by deed of variation. So if, for example, the property is left to a non-qualifying descendant and between uh, the, the family members, they agree a deed of variation that it is left to a qualifying descendant, yes, you can create availability of RNRB relief as a result of a deed of variation by amending the legatee from a non-qualifying one to a qualifying one. What they do with the property afterwards is then their affairs and their business, okay? Um, as we know, deed of variation replaces the terms of the will, so the outcome is taken from the deed of variation rather than the original will wording. Okay. Moving on. What if we've got estates worth more than two million, the threshold that we touched on earlier? Um, in those circumstances, the, uh, the RNRB relief uh, is tapered. It, 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 it gradually whittles away and the the allowance is reduced by every pound sorry by a pound for every two pound over um, the value of two million threshold the value of the estate taper purposes is the total of all the assets in the estate less any debts or liabilities when you're working out the value of the estate for tapering of rnrb you do not take off any exemptions such as spouse exemptions you don't take into account relief such as agricultural or business property relief. Um, assets that are specifically excluded from IHT are ignored, okay? Let's move forward. Um, we're now, let's think about the spouse. So if we've got some tapering, um, can also reduce the amount of RNRB available to transfer to a surviving spouse or civil partner, even if no RNRB is used when the first of the couple dies. The amount of transferred RNRB to the survivor's estate uh, that, that can be claimed using a uh, percentage of RNRB that was not used when the first couple, the first of the couple die. If the estate of the first of the couple to die is worth more than two million, tapering will reduce the amount of unused RNRB in that estate. This in turn reduces the amount of RNRB that is transferable to the surviving husband, wife or civil partner's estate. We're starting to get a bit more complicated here in relation to these and this is going to take, if you ever encounter these, a little bit of maths 
to work it through. Um, it may be something that the lawyers get involved with. It may be something that the, the client, the surviving client, client spouse um, needs to be thinking about in terms of their estate going forward as well. Um, let's have a look, quickie look at another example. This is quite a long example and there's a little bit of a mistake in here as well. In names, not in terms of technicality. Um, Charlie dies in the tax year 1819, living in a state worth uh, 2.1 million. He leaves a £450,000 home to his wife, Linda, uh, everything else to his children. The maximum r and RV in, in that tax year is £125,000. Being as his children don't inherit the home, his estate cannot use any r and RV. Without the effect of tapering, he would have unused r and RV of £125,000. But his estate is worth more than the taper threshold of £2 million by 100000 So we've got an issue here. Next slide, please. The RNRB available to Charlie's estate tapers by every pound for every two pound over the taper threshold. So the RNRB reduces by 50,000 for that year. This is a the mistake you can obviously see. Uh, if Brian, no apologies, that should be Charlie. Um, dra draftsman will, will have his knuckles wrapped in relation to, uh, to that in due course. If Charlie left his home to his children, the RNRB would have been £75,000, i.e. the threshold, 125000 less the tapered uh, reduction of 50000 So the amount of unused RNRB is 75000 The percentage of unused RNRB in his estate is 60%. If Linda then dies, in tax year 2021, the maximum RNRB is 175,000. If Linda has an estate worth 1.8 million, so we're not looking at any tapering from her perspective, including her home worth now 500,000, which she leaves to her children. How much relief are we looking at? The amount of relief that will be available in her estate is the, the amount for that year at the percentage from her husband's estate. This is the transferable bit, not her own. This is a transferable bit. Um, and that will be 105,000. So Linda's estate will qualify for 175,000 of relief based on her estate, plus a further 105,000 transferred RNRB from Charlie's estate to give a total quantum of 280,000 of RNRB relief in Linda's estate. That's quite a straightforward example. A real life will get much more complicated than that and you will need to work through uh, the math to get that right. There's no simple one size fits all solution to this. <coughs> Briefly countering through a few other reliefs that we're not going to go through in detail. This is a whole subject area in its own right, and they will probably be largely dealt with by uh, the lawyers, as I say, dealing with the estate. So we've got business property relief first. Um, you can get a uh, hundred percent business property relief on move forward please um yeah 100 business property relief on a business in uh, business interest uh sorry a business or an interest in a business and shares in an unlisted company you can get 50 percent bpr on shares uh controlling more than 50 percent of voting rights in a listed company land build is machinery owned by the deceased and used in the bit in their business um you only get relief if the deceased owned the business or asset for at least two years before they died. Um, here's an interesting contrast with pubs. Um, promise there'd be a pub example. During um, the, the previous material that we did regarding pubs, um, we were talking about um, personal property relief and you wanted the value attributed to, <coughs> excuse me, Tribute to the home part 
So disposal in lifetime of the business part was reduced, albeit you would get uh, entrepreneurs relief on that. Perhaps on a death, you might want um, the, the value more attributed to the business part rather than the home part, especially if it's not going to be passed on, say, to a spouse or anybody that would qualify for those uh, other reliefs. Because if you've got the business being passed on to, say, a third party and it qualifies for BPR, then that would take a, a much bigger slice out of the estate, chargeable estate, than what it would do for the residential part. So you, you've got a perhaps a, an interesting contrast between where you may want value to be attributed on a death as opposed to where you may want value attributed during a lifetime transfer of a pub, say, for example, where you've got a mixed use building, you've got business use and residential use. So moving on, the, the, the next relief is a little bit more focused because it's it, it's largely our agricultural clients uh, that it attaches to. Uh, this is agricultural property relief. Um, it, it kicks in in relation to land and pasture used for crops. It also uh, <coughs> covers those uh, th those other sub bullets. Um, property uh, may be owner occupied or let. Uh, but it must be part of a working farm in the UK, Channel Islands, Isle of Man, EEA. Whether those definitions will change going forward with Brexit, don't know. Um, let's see what the world uh, ends up like next year. Um, it must have been owned and occupied for agricultural purposes, <coughs> either by the owner for two years prior to death, or if not occupied by the owner, um, owned for seven years prior to death. Agricultural property relief is due at 100% if, if it's owned uh, by the farmer themselves, it's used by someone else for short-term grazing on a licence or it was a tenancy that began uh, after the 1st of September 95. There is a lower rate of relief in all other circumstances of 50%. Again, you'd need to work through the, the, the detail. None of this is simple and straightforward and it, it does involve a lot of research work to get the things right. Um, another relief, and this occurs where you have deaths in what's called quick succession, hence QSR, quick succession relief. It's designed to relieve the burden of a sec on a second estate where it, uh, the death occurs within five years of an earlier transfer um, where IHT becomes, where tax becomes payable. Um, it's given by reducing the tax payable on the second death estate, uh, and it's made by reference to the tax that was paid on the earlier estate. Okay, uh, the relief reduces the tax payable. <coughs> it includes settled property, and it can also include gifts with reservation. The move on slides, please. Um, Provided the tax is payable on any part of the deceased estate, it does not matter that part of the deceased estate is chargeable, uh, which part of the estate is chargeable for QSR to apply. So we've got a, a, a quickie example on this, then we'll just rattle into exempt gifts uh, and, a, and a, a couple of other uh, wrap up slides. So Norman inherited a house from a uh, on the death of a parent, an IHT was paid. Norman lived in the house and then unfortunately died uh, relatively soon after in 2020. Uh, by will, Norman left his estate to his, uh, left the whole estate to, to his wife, Norma. Uh, Norma was the life tenant under the family settlement. The trust fund value was 400,000 on Norman's death and passed to uh, nephews and nieces. On Norman's death, passed to nephews and nieces. QSR is due, sorry, that should be Norman's death, not Charlie's. Uh, another naming problem. Uh, the fact that the prom property which he received on the earlier transfer is exempt on his death doesn't matter as a tax is paid on a part of his estate, the settled property, the QSR provisions apply. Okay. Quick rattle through some exempt gifts. Um, an individual can leave uh, 3,000 pounds of gifts each tax year without them being added to the value of the estate. Any unused annual exemption can be carried forward to the next year, but only for one year. 
Um, so you can double up. So if it's not been used in a year, it's essentially 6,000 for the current year. Each year, a person can give away various gifts in relation to marriage, and it depends on their relationship to uh, the partner, or sorry, the individuals getting married. Um, they can give normal gifts out of income. Um, problem with that is proving it, and you need to have good records to be able to do that. You can help somebody meet their living costs, such as an elderly relative or child under 18, uh, and you can give to charities and ironically political parties, and they'll be exempt gifts as well. Um, practical issues in relation to a client death, probate. If probate hasn't been issued, no one can legally represent the estate. So in those circumstances, who signs off a pre-death tax return? When do you file the pre-death tax return? What if the pre-death return is filed after the 31st of January? Who pays the tax in respect to the pre-death period? What about penalties? Um, I've actually had an example of this myself. I had a client unfortunately pass away in mid-January. Tax return was due, this is a number of years ago, tax return was due by the end of January. Um, nobody could sign it off. He died in test aid. Um, so there was nobody that could an administer uh, his affairs. Um, nobody could actually make a payment. Um, unsurprisingly, HMRC uh, machinery kicks into overdrive and starts issuing late filing penalties and all the shenanigans around that. It is actually an easy one to get rid of, but they have to be told about the debt and you have to be firm in saying there is nobody that can legally do this as much as they may sit there and protest, yes, but we are due our return by the end of January. Well, go on then, how are you going to do it? Nobody can legally sign off that return until there is a personal representative or an executor that has the capacity to do so and likewise make payment. It is a valid excuse to get rid of those circumstances. They will turn around and say, well, as soon as you've got it, we expect it to be done within 30 days. Um, that may or may not be achievable but be aware that you can see the revenue off, but be aware of those practical problems where probate um, has not been issued. There is nobody that can represent the individual's lifetime affairs until that has happened. So we've got some practical issues as well in terms of an executor, which I know sometimes we're, we're asked to become uh, in terms of uh, clients' estates. It's an onerous position, be aware of that. There's lots of obligations you're dealing with lots of complex taxation matters. There's time limits that kick in. Be aware that penalties can't be charged on the deceased, but they can be charged on an executor. And this is a relatively recent stat. Over 5,000 estates are investigated annually by the revenue. They're largely looking to uplift value. So you're looking at things getting involved with uh, valuations office and that sort of stuff. So these are particularly onerous obligations and be aware of that when you take the law. Um, just wrapping up now in summary, death of a client is challenging and distressing. It goes without saying. It definitely adds to the complexity of the compliance requirements and the revenue are not always sensitive. To be fair to capital taxes and those that deal with IHT returns, they are much more sensitive than most other parts of HMRC. Um, but you will encounter, or you can encounter, insensitive, insensitivity um, from the revenue. Um, at times, you need the broad shoulders to um, deal with it and, and get them to move on. There are demands placed on the executors, so if you're taking on that role, be aware of it. It's not uh, just a simple case of filling in a form and, and, and signing some details. And I think it goes without saying, if in doubt, seek help. Seek help from your fellow members, seek help from um, those that have got experience, lend on the experience of those that have done these sorts of things before. It isn't a, an easy time when you have the death of a client to deal with. It is challenging. Um, the last thing you want to do is really deal with something that is at the, the outer edge of um, you could either capacity to deal with or skill to deal with, you're then going to have an even more distressed 
uh, client's family uh, to deal with, which can in itself become even more challenging and distressing. So it, it, there's no harm in seeking help in these circumstances. Um, you're there to help the client and the client's family. Um, I'm sure you're all going to be able to, to do that in your own ways, but if you do need help with any of the technicalities, my, my recommendation would be seek it. Okay, that's the end of my material. I think we're on time. I think we've got time for some questions, John. So, yeah, thank you, Andy. Uh, and again, um, having been an executor uh, myself on, um, uh, I'm afraid on, on a few occasions, I can uh, very much associate myself with some of the, the uh, examples that you, you've given today. And uh, thank you for, for um, covering it. We have got a few questions and I'm going to try and uh, get through them so uh, we can uh, get to the break. But uh, um, this, there, there was quite a, a few questions at the beginning. Um, if VAT is chargeable, this may have an impact on business profits assessed for income tax. Yes. Perhaps a reduction in profit uh, assessable for tax is a question there. Yes, but it would be within those six years that can be um, looked at in, in the six year prior to death. Unfortunately, that will be one of those circumstances that if um, VAT is, say, uh, picked up for a 16 year period of time, uh, because the, the legislation allows, income tax would only allow um, the last six years. The rub for the deceased is they've essentially got away with 10 years worth of not having to pay income tax on the on the first 10 years um, that they should have paid tax on. So, um, OK, they, they don't align fully. Um, and, and it perhaps from an advisor's perspective looks a little bit odd that you're paying that in a period where there's no income tax. But don't lose sight of the fact that those 10 years where you're not paying income tax, you're not paying income tax at all. So. Um, Okay, thank, thank you, Andy. Um, so when someone dies in, in state um, with no relatives, what happens to the estate tax wise? Um, with, with no relatives, well, it depends on, in, 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 it depends in terms of whether they have a will or whether they, uh, you, you need to then go down uh, the laws of intestacy. This is perhaps more of a legal question than a tax question mm -hmm. because the tax will follow what the uh, the law actually says in terms of who inherits. If there's a will and um, the, the estate is passed to uh, maybe very distant relatives or it's passed to a friend, um, the, the estate will bear the, uh, the, the, the tax um, that is due if it is chargeable. I mean, don't forget that there's, a, that there's reliefs that can kick in. Uh, and it's not guaranteed that they will always be it will always be chargeable um, if the uh, if you go down the law that the line of intestacy and there is absolutely nobody that that can inherit um, either friend family distant relatives and it, it, it really does go down the, the the very distant family tree or it can do um, then I believe that it's the crown that inherits now it would seem bizarre that the crown would then pay tax on what it's inheriting. So I, I think in those circumstances, it's a bit of a moot point, but you would, it would, I think in the way you've got somebody that, that is in that position, the key is to be working with the lawyer to understand who is getting uh, the estate. And then that will determine how the tax would then be evaluated. Okay, thank you. Uh, there's a few more questions coming through. So I'm rattling through these. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, there are instances where a parent leaves their property to their child or children drawn up by a lawyer before the parent's death. Mm -hmm. Assuming they are adults, the home is included in the parent's estate. But when the house is sold um, and there is a uh, capital gain for the child, am I right saying that the home is still included in the estate? Sorry, could you go through the, 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 the right. question again? There are instances where a parent leaves their property to their child or children drawn up by a lawyer before the parent's death. Yeah. Assuming they are adults, the home is included in the parent's estate. But when the house is sold, um, I think it says there is a, a capital gain for the child. Am I right saying that the home is still included in the estate? 
if if the original owner is still the owner on the deeds of the property, reg, land registry, that sort of stuff, yes, it will be included in their estate. On the basis it is inherited by the children, um, relief would kick in, as we touched on earlier, the RNRB uh, relief. If the um, in, in disposing of the asset, the, the executor, it would be inherited by the children at the date of death. If, if they are um, actual owners or co-owners of the property before the deceased passed on, their proportion, um, they, they don't inherit that, they already own it. They only inherit what the, is left by the person that has passed away. Okay, thank you, Andy. Um, Right, and, and I hope you don't mind us just running over slightly just so we can get through these questions. If X left the personal home worth 700,000 to his wife, 50% and his daughter 50%, after, three, after the 325,000 exempt amount, would the wife's 50% share be exempt from IHT as a transfer between spouses? Yes, yeah, transfer between spouses are, are, are exempt. Um, in terms of um, the the RNRB and the interaction with the basic uh, allowance, the the proportion that the daughter would inherit would be eligible for RNRB, but you would have to work through the maths. And I can't I can't give uh, a, a a simple answer without working that through. But yes, spouse um, a spouse transfer um, is it would be wholly exempt. Okay, thank you. Uh, what source do HMRC and you value a home when a person dies? Zoopla uh, or other <laughs> such websites? <laughs> um, if they're doing it properly, they should actually use valuations office and actually get somebody who knows what they're doing rather than just consent consulting um, a random um, a random website. I, I, I have had this many times, not just with uh, in, inheritance stuff, but with um, probably more relevant for income tax and, and, and CGT matters. Um, you, you get things thrown at you of, um, Zoopla's website says it's worth this. And you go, well, yeah, that's a random property in a random area in a random postcode. Um, it's not this one. And it doesn't take into account the specific condition of the property. So they should, if they're doing it properly, use in valuations office. Um, if you have got a client where you feel that that's the approach that's been taken, and you are of the view that the value that they are asserting is is not right. It's far too excessive. Um, then then I would challenge it. These things are not unchallengeable at the end of the day. All right. Uh, how long does a client's papers need to be kept if there is no IHT uh, due? Uh, I would suggest probably um, two two years. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if this is actually defined in statute. Um, I would be surprised if it's six years, to be perfectly honest, because if you fall below threshold, um, whilst it's reportable, they should turn that round pretty quickly. They're either going to do one or two things. They're going to go, yes, agreed, rubber stamp, in which case, fine. Um, or they're going to challenge it because they think, well, actually, you've you're putting cheeky valuations and it, it should be over threshold and we should be due a, a little bit of IHT, in which case they should challenge it quickly so that it can be dealt with. Um, so I would suggest perhaps um, two years. It, in, in the absence of um, a, a time period, I'm, I'm not aware of one in this context. I mean, clearly if, it's a, if there's a business, you need to retain records for, for six years in that case. Um, particularly as it, it fits with a bit the revenue's ability to assess income tax in that context. Uh, but for mm -hmm. IHT, I would say perhaps two years, if it's a simple, straightforward matter. Um, I think six months is probably pushing it too much. Two years feels about right. If you want to keep it longer, then obviously keep it longer. OK, I'm going to just ask two more questions, only if I may. Um, if the client does not have a will, would all the assets automatically be eligible for inheritance tax? All, all the all assets um, are, are potentially chargeable to inheritance tax. Um, the, the, the absence of a will doesn't uh, change the chargeability. The, the absence of the will um, then 
changes the environment of actually who inherits the, the assets because you're then into the laws of intestacy. And this is really um, the lawyer's province, not the tax man's province. Um, but the assets themselves potentially are still chargeable, but equally you've still got to take into account any liabilities or debts that could reduce the value of those assets as well. Okay, thank you. And I'm going to do one last question before we break. Um, if a married person with children fails to make a will and he dies, Will the property be automatically passed on to the kids or wife? And if so, is there any tax implications? In, in terms of, um, well, one, it depends on the value of the property in terms of if it's not inherited by the wife. If there's no will, you would, like I say, generally following the laws of intestacy, it will be spouse first, then children, but then you start getting things like um, brothers, sisters, nephews, nieces, um, other wider family potentially having a claim on the estate. They have to make a claim on the estate, as I understand. Um, that it, where there isn't a will, you really need to be talking to the lawyer in terms of what the laws of intestacy are. If under the laws of intestacy, the, the, the property of the deceased passes to the spouse, the spouse exemption would kick in. If the property passes to children and it's the home, then you're into RNRB territory as well so the, the provisions of the reliefs follow where the assets ultimately end up going and that may end up going by the terms of the will itself or it might be by the terms of the operation of intestacy thank you andy uh, right i'm going to stop there um because okay. i'm aware that uh, we've just run over by about five or six minutes there but andy as always um very informative uh, presentation very clear um uh, you know, with, with uh, the number of questions we've got, and there was others there, and we we probably try and get those over to you at some point. But okay. um, if, if those on, on this call have got questions, um, you've got Andy's details. Um, within the recording of uh, this, this uh, webinar, um, you will be able to access his slides uh, and make contact with, with Andy direct. But uh, Andy, thank you very much again. I hope to see you again very soon in our in our next series. We've not yet uh, set some dates, but look forward to seeing you again. Uh, okay, thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you, uh, everybody, and uh, have a good day, the rest of you. you. Okay, right, everyone.